Yeah. Okay. Good evening. My name is Mark Wagner. I um, would like to, first of all, take this opportunity to thank Shannon O'Kelly and IRG for hosting this webinar. For the next 30, probably 45 to 60 minutes, we'll be talking about shoulder injuries and how we can treat them minimally invasively um, without having to deal with uh, major surgical procedures. Um, I'm going to go through kind of a slide deck at first. Um, bear with me. It is a new slide deck that I haven't um, used before, so hopefully everything works well. Um, let me move on to our next slide, which is okay. So basically, I a little bit, just a little bit about myself. I'm a board certified uh, uh, physician. I've been practicing in Seattle for over 30 years. Uh, I was at the sports medicine clinic uh, back in, in the 80s, 90s, uh, basically from 87 to 2015. I was the medical director of the sports medicine clinic, which at the time was the oldest and largest sports medicine clinic in the country. Uh, I was also a consulting team physician for the Seattle Mariners uh, for most of that period of time. I then was at ProLine Surgeons uh, from 2015 to 2017, and then starting in 2017, ended up uh, starting my own practice that uh, uh, pretty much specializes in uh, regenerative medicine and the, the treatment of uh, stem cells, as well as uh, seeing orthopedic uh, sports uh, injuries. So what, what is regenerative medicine? I've got a short, I believe it's about a three or four minute uh, video. It's very simplistic, but it gives a, a really good um, overview uh, as to what stem cells are, uh, what they do, and how they work. So I'm going to start that right now. So we drag this here and go to full screen and play. What is stem cell therapy? Stem cell therapy is an injection treatment designed to heal injuries and reduce pain. It is used for arthritis and injuries to ligaments, tendons, muscles, cartilage, and bone. First, let's look at the difference between human embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells. The embryonic stem cells are pluripotent, meaning that they can become of any of the more than 200 known differentiated cell types of the human body. On the other hand, adult stem cells are multipotent, meaning that they can develop into more than one cell type but are more limited and controlled and thus safer than pluripotent cells. We perform the adult stem cell treatment. What is the role of these stem cells? To understand this better, let's look at this example. Your house is exposed to different elements, such as wind, fire, rain, sun, and time all cause damage to the structure. To keep your house in order and repair any damage, you need different professionals like firefighters, construction workers, insurance agents, and a contractor to supervise and direct the project. This is no different than your personal life. You need a dentist, lawyer, financial advisor, doctors, insurance agent, and a barber, along with other professionals. So both your house and your life require different professionals and specialists to keep them working well. And your body needs stem cells. Now, let's dive deeper and see what happens to your joints. In a normal healthy joint, you have plenty of stem cells. These cells are not only capable of doing maintenance and repairs, they also know when and where these repairs are needed. The stem cells work as a contractor that in addition to giving instruction for repairs and maintenance, can transform into specialized cells to do whatever is needed to fix any problem. When you have enough of these stem cells, there's a balance between damage and repair, and you have no pain and no injuries. Think about when you were 18 years old. You were able to run, jump, and do the same the next day without pain. 
The only problem is that with time, the number of these stem cells goes down, or sometimes the severity of the injury or damage is more than the ability of your body to repair it. This leads to an imbalance and ultimately leads to arthritis, injuries, and pain. In essence, as you age, you have a lower number of contractors and workers available to do the job, or sometimes the amount of damage is too much for the available stem cells. But fortunately, there are areas of your body that keep a good number of stem cells. These areas include the bone marrow of the hips and the fat in your abdomen and buttocks. And this is the key to stem cell therapy. The doctor will take stem cells from one or both of these areas and transfer them to the area of injury or arthritis. This will provide the stem cells needed for repair. In essence, the treatment will supply the manpower needed to do the job. Once there, these cells secrete growth factors that will organize and coordinate other cells to do the repairs. This leads to healing. This is like the contractor giving instructions to get the job done. This treatment can be used for pain with injuries coming from ligaments, tendons, muscles, bones, cartilage, and meniscus. When is it useful? If you have an injury or an arthritic condition that did not improve with therapy, medication, other injections, or surgery, or if you were told you need surgery, then stem cells is a great option for you. Thanks for watching. Okay, um, so orthopedic injuries and illnesses that can be treated are uh, three broad categories, osteoarthritis, muscle and tendon injuries, and meniscus and labrum tears. There's, um, there's a more or much broader overview on stem cell treatments. Actually, it's a, you can pull it up on YouTube if you just uh, YouTube my name and it's, uh, stem cell therapy. And it basically kind of looks at other joints such as you know, knees and hips and wrists and ankles and elbows. Um, but we're gonna pretty much be focusing on um, shoulders uh, uh, today. So um, the shoulder conditions <clears throat> that we commonly treat with stem cells are rotator cuff tears, and I'll, I'll kind of give you a little brief overview for of, uh, all those. Um, we'll get more into specifics soon. So the rotator cuff is basically the stabilizing uh, muscles of the uh, shoulder joint, the small muscles that stabilize the, the ball and socket joint. Labrum tears, now labrum is a cartilage rim that's within the shoulder joint, kind of analogous to a meniscus tear in a knee. Osteoarthritis, tendonitis, and frozen shoulder, or what we call adhesive capsulitis. So getting back to the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is comprised of four tendons. They are the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the subscapularis, and the teres minor. They basically are the stabilizers for the shoulder joints so that the larger muscles such as the deltoid and the pectoralis, um, biceps and triceps can basically function and move the shoulder, but you need those small muscles to stabilize the joint. Um, although we talk about them as individual tendons, they kind of blend together to stabilize the shoulder joint. The most uh, significantly uh, injured or damaged one is the supraspinatus, that's the main rotator cuff tendon comes right across the top of the of the shoulder. Um, but any of the four can be involved with, with tears or tendonitis. Um, so if we look at rotator cuff disease, and we'll just call it disease, which can be tendonitis, partial tears, um, tendinopathy, which is long-standing inflammation, or complete tears. We see it in about 30 to 50% of the, 
of the population aged 50 or greater. But we also see it in athletes and in active individuals basically at any age, especially throwing athletes, swimming athletes, anybody who's doing a lot of overhead motion. So in the, in, for years and years and years, it was always felt that if you had a tear in your rotator cuff, you needed to have surgery. Um, that, that is true for certain types of tears. If you have a complete acute tear of your rotator cuff, then yes, you do need surgery. But for people who have chronic tears or people who have partial tears in their tendons, there's a, there's a number of studies, and I'm, I've kind of gone through them here because I, I, I want people to understand the success and the failure rate with uh, surgery. When you do surgery for partial rotator cuff tears, you're putting basically sutures in an area of the tendon that has a really, really poor blood supply. That's why those tendons tear in those areas to begin with. So basically, if you go in, you put a bunch of sutures and you try to reef up that tendon, they tend to fail. And it's, it's just not a great surgery for a partial tear or even complete tears that haven't pulled completely away from the bone. Um, some of the studies, um, they, they did a study at the Cleveland Clinic and um, there was just a 14 patient study. All had arthroscopic repairs and 100% of those patients' repairs had failed in one year. The National Institute of Health did a study that found kind of a real wide range of failure, but said that anywhere from 30 to 94% of those surgeries for rotator cuff tears failed. The Journal of Current Reviews in Musculoskeletal Medicine um, basically, uh, as part of that article, the doctors at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City acknowledged that, and the quote was, surgery did not offer what patients wanted in both pain relief and in function. Uh, an Australian study, um, a fairly large patient population of 500 patients who underwent arthroscopic repair of rotator cuff tears, the failure rate was 57%. So the reason that they fail once again is because it's a really bad blood supply in that area and they just don't end up doing well. Um, once again, complete tears, an acute complete tear of the rotator cuff tear, the stem cell treatment is not gonna bridge a gap. And those patients do need surgical procedures to have those um, tendons put back basically and anchor back to the to the bone, the head of the humerus. Um, it's a big surgery. It can result in significant pain, stiffness, decreased range of motion. And patients can be out of work sometimes for six to eight months, depending upon what their work is that they're trying to get back to. Um, and then people ask, well, what about just doing a cortisone injection? Uh, in the joint. I'm not a big fan of doing cortisone injections in joints. Um, the reason being that it tends to weaken and damage the rotator cuff. What it may do is it may give people some short-term relief and it's kind of like putting a Band-Aid on it, but ultimately in the long run, it can cause further damage to the rotator cuff as well as joint destruction. I mean, it the in, especially in weight-bearing joints, which we're not talking about right now, but it basically accelerates the breakdown of cartilage, more so in weight-bearing joints, but also in, in the shoulder itself. Um, Journal of Radiology in 2019, uh, basically looking at studies of patients who had had cortisone injections, came up with the conclusions that definitely cortisone injections or steroid injections accelerate the progression of osteoarthritis they weaken the bone and can cause fractures and they can cause bone death or what we call osteonecrosis. Um, so we mentioned earlier, we talked about the labrum. So kind of an analogy that, that I use sometimes is that 
if you picture the head of the humerus, so the ball of the shoulder joint, um, that's the bowling ball, okay? The labrum is kind of like the barrier between the lane and the gutter. It keeps, if, if the labrum is stable and the labrum is, is there, it basically keeps the ball in the lane. So it, it lends stability to the shoulder joint. Um, when the shoulder is unstable, that ball goes into the gutter. That's why there's a reason that that labrum is there, just like there's a reason that the people have meniscuses in their knees. So we're, we shouldn't be in a big hurry to just remove those structures, um, which oftentimes is, is the surgery for it because there is really no blood supply to the labrum. So there's not much you can do to repair the labrum. Um, so oftentimes after surgery or a surgical procedure is to just remove the portion of the labrum that is torn. And that, that can be a, a long and painful recovery. And oftentimes there's, there's no significant improvement in mobility or function. Um, as we just talked about, the shoulder can remain unstable and it can lead to further injuries such as rotator cuff tears or osteoarthritis. So as much as we, we can, we really like to leave those structures intact within the, the shoulder joint itself. Okay, so stem cell therapy. What does stem cells uh, do? They, they do a number of things. The stem cells that I use, when I do a procedure, I almost exclusively use what we call autologous cells. In other words, cells that come from the patient's tissue. So we take stem cells from bone marrow, from fat, and we take platelets from blood. It goes through a, a highly specialized and proprietary software system that runs a very complicated centrifuge that isolates out what we call adult mesenchymal stem cells. Those are the cells we want. We don't want embryonic cells. We don't want pluripotent cells, the ones that can grow up to be 200 different types of tissue. We want cells that can grow up to be four types of tissue, and that is muscle, tendon, cartilage, and bone. So we, we isolate those cells we, because there are places in the body, like the video I talked about earlier, that have really high concentrations of those cells, being bone marrow and fat. Bone marrow, the cells that come from bone marrow are extremely robust and healthy and have a very long lifespan. Also within those samples that we take, there is a great deal of what we call cytokines and growth factors and exosomes, all these things that are needed for the healing process to occur. However, with age, the num numbers of bone marrow stem cells diminishes. It's still pretty high, even at a late age. We've done many patients in their mid-90s. Um, fat is just the opposite. Fat has tons of stem cells that basically stay stable throughout your entire life. But they are not quite as robust, and they don't have quite as long of a lifespan as do the bone marrow cells. Um, nor are there the growth factors, the cytokines, and the exosomes that we um, get from bone marrow. Platelets, which we get from blood, are great little packages of growth factors and cytokines, and they basically are fertilizer for stem cells. So it's really important that when we do stem cell procedures, whether it be for rotator cuff tear or labrum tear or osteoarthritis, that you use the gold standard. The gold standard is we want stem cells from bone marrow, from fat, and platelets from blood. We don't want to just use one or the other. And that's pretty much, if you look at major centers across the country, like Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, that's, that's exactly what, what they're doing there. And that's what I do in my office. And we've treated close to 16,000 patients that way. Um, so the cells that we then inject under ultrasound guidance to the air, whether we're looking at a rotator cuff tear or we're looking at osteoarthritis or labrum tear. So the cells are directed by virtue of using a, a ultrasound machine. The first thing they do is they stop the inflammation. They stop the breakdown of the tissue. They then go through a pathway and end up as chondrocytes, which are cartilage producing cells. They also end up as myoblasts, which can produce a new tendon and new muscle tissue. 
Um, and as chondrocytes, they can also deal with damaged tissue to the labrum. So it's a really neat thing in the shoulder because it's wonderful when we have patients who come in, they've got osteoarthritis, they've got a torn labrum, and they've got partially torn rotator cuff. We can treat all three of those conditions with basically one procedure that lasts about 90 minutes. So osteoarthritis, fairly common, uh, can be as a result of old injuries, shoulder dislocations, rotator cuff tears, previous surgeries to the joint, um, or it could be just family history. Um, so the options for the shoulder surgically are not great. It's basically a total joint replacement. Um, so total joint replacement versus stem cell therapy. Total joint replacement is a fairly big surgery. It does significantly limit patients going forward as far as doing any type of overhead sports, weight training. Oftentimes patients are can't really expect to do much over five or 10 pounds in that arm. Certainly no heavy work, um, no, no lifting really greater than 20 pounds. And the shoulder surgery or the shoulder replacement tends to have a, a lifespan of about eight to 10 years. Um, just not, not a great option uh, for the shoulder as opposed to treating patients with um, autologous stem cells. Some of the complications that we see with total shoulder replacement you can tear the rotator cuff. You can end up with an unstable joint um, by virtue of, of putting the prostheses in place. You can fracture the humerus, can also damage nerves and blood vessels. And anytime you're having a large surgical procedure and putting a foreign body into your joint or taking away your joint and putting in a foreign body, there's always a risk for infection. So for osteoarthritis, stem cells were basically depending upon where patients are in the course of the disease process. My, patients who have mild to moderate or mild to moderately severe osteoarthritis in their shoulder joints, big data says 80 to 85% of those patients get at least 80% improvement. And that's improvement in pain and in function. In, our patient population, and which we're close to 16,000 or maybe over 16,000 patients now, we're looking at about a 91% of our patients who are at least 75% improved. Now that is patients across the board, patients who have mild osteoarthritis all the way to severe osteoarthritis. And that's not just um, shoulders. We haven't split it out to just shoulders, but the shoulder data is pretty much comparable with our knee data, which is really high in those percentages of patients that do extremely well. Some of the other um, conditions that we treat with stem cells, tendonitis, um, whether it be the rotator cuff or the biceps tendon. Usually when I'm treating just tendonitis, and, and these are patients which we wanna know that they have gone through and failed physical therapy, anti-inflammatories. Um, they have basically looked at, at biomechanical issues, made sure that there's no other significant issues going on inside the shoulder joint, such as a rotator cuff tear or a labrum tear. So we want to try all the conservative treatment first. What I will do then oftentimes is offer the patients just a PRP injection which is very good for, for addressing tendonitis, any of the itises as far as inflammatory responses to muscles or tendons. I have a lot of people that, that come to see me for, they wanna do stem cells um, on their shoulder. We end up looking at the shoulder, getting an MRI, and I said, you know, you don't, don't have a labrum tear. You don't have osteoarthritis. You really don't have any tears in your cuff. Um, I think you'd probably be better off just doing PRP um, and we do PRP and patients tend to do really well with just the PRP injection, not needing to go through the, necessarily the, uh, the bone marrow and the uh, liposuction. Um, a, a little bit about the, the actual procedure itself. When we take the stem cells, we get them from 
kind of the back of your pelvis, which is um, a bone marrow aspiration, which is done under local anesthetic. We do give you a little medication ahead of time. The actual withdrawal of the bone marrow, since we have done so many of these, takes less than a minute. Um, as far as discomfort, I'd say half the patients are like, are you kidding, doc? You're done? And half of them are like, wow, oh boy, I can really feel that. I, sometimes people describe it as like sciatic nerve pain going down their leg or like a deep hollow or vacuum type sensation. But as soon as that needle is out and we've extracted the bone marrow, which like I said, is, is less than a minute, the pain is gone. Um, we then kind of move just to the side of where we did that bone marrow aspiration and then do a, a mini liposuction, kind of in the love handle area. And that's where we obtain the fat cells. Prior to doing both of those, we draw blood and, and each, each one of those samples goes through a, a separate individual program on this centrifuge so that we can isolate out either the stem cells or the platelets. We then end up with three separate syringes, one with stem cells from bone marrow, one with stem cells from fat, and one with platelets. And then under ultrasound guidance, we inject those to either the area of the rotator cuff, the labrum, or just within the joint itself so that we can initiate a healing process. It's one needle into the shoulder and then three separate syringes. Basically takes about a minute or so to do that, if even. Uh, afterwards, um, we encourage range of motion right away. Patients walk out, do need a ride. I don't like anybody driving after a procedure. And we start physical therapy three to five days later. Physical therapy is really important because those cells that we just put in that joint, they need this external environmental stimuli so they know who to grow up to be. And that's where therapy comes in. So it's really important that we do therapy. Some of it is gonna be holding the patient back a little bit because although you may feel really good, we don't want you doing too much too fast. In the first six weeks, those stem cells are a little bit fragile. So I don't want patients doing you know, push-ups or you know, overhead stuff, or no American Ninja Warrior or anything like that. But you're using your arm. I mean, basically, you're doing physical therapy. Most people can get back to easy golf by six weeks, swimming by six weeks. Certainly, I mean, you can be doing anything that involves your lower extremities and hiking or, or um, cycling. Um, so the main thing is first six weeks, we kind of limit activities a little bit. We do physical therapy. And then we progress on as the patient progresses in physical therapy. By 12 weeks, I have patients do whatever they feel like they can do because those cells are rock solid and they, you're not going to damage them at 12 weeks. Improvement tends to go out to about a year and then tends to level off. There's some data out of Japan says two years and then tends to level off uh, there. I have patients, I've been doing this about seven years, who are out seven years and doing just great. Some of my colleagues around the country at uh, Emory and Harvard have been doing this 16, well, 12 and 16 years, have patients that are out 12 and 16 years doing just fine. Um, no, the, the, the worst case scenario with stem cells is that you fall into that basically that nine to 15% bucket and you don't get significantly better because it's not a hundred percent slam dunk guarantee. There really, there isn't anything in, in this world that is. Um, so that's the worst case scenario. But since we're using your own cells, we don't have to worry about all these potential downfalls that we see with major surgical procedures. Um, the only other downside to orthobiologics or stem cells is the fact that unfortunately the procedure itself is not covered by insurance. Um, physical therapy follow-up is stem cells are considered um, investigational by the FDA. They are approved for intraoperative use, for treatment of certain cancers, and for treatment of wound healing. But 
they're not approved for treatment of osteoarthritis rotator cuff tears, meniscus tears, um, percutaneously, in other words, through the skin. You end up with two very, very small incisions that are basically about a centimeter in length that we just close with a stereoscrip. Um, and then the injection basically in the joint itself is just a, a needle injection. So that's kind of an overview about uh, shoulders. And I think I wanna leave plenty of time because I'm sure a lot of people have, have questions and then I'm happy to sit here and go through all of them. Okay, so let me uh, let me take a look here and see. Um, so, can can stem cells uh, actually regrow cartilage? Uh, yes, and I do have um, anecdotally. I've had patients who we've done MRIs either a year or two years. Um, after the procedure and, and definitely do see uh, repair of certain areas of the, of the cartilage, such as craters and fissures and cracks within the, uh, the cartilage itself. Um, had a patient who was an ultrasonographer down at Stanford that we, he had done some very, very extensive studies prior to his procedure and then came to see me four months afterwards, brought his laptop to show me because he was so thrilled that his, the thickness of his articular cartilage had increased from 0.7 to 1.5 millimeters over the period of four months, that it had more than doubled over that period of time. They did a study at NIH in Atlanta in 2016 where they did monthly MRIs on a very, very highly sensitive MRI machine that we don't have access commercially to use. And they could see significant, statistically significant increase in thickness in the cartilage by three months. Okay, I'm gonna just kind of scroll through these and see what other questions. Why aren't stem cells covered by insurance? Uh, I heard maybe for knees, but not for shoulders. They're not covered for knees or shoulders. Um, you know, some of it has to do with the fact that there aren't any really large uh, double-blinded randomized studies out there because, so say you've got bad arthritis in your knee or your shoulder and I'm Stanford and we're doing a study and you come to me and we say, yeah, let's get you in the study. Um, we would go through this whole procedure and then you wouldn't know, nor would I, for three to five years, if you got your stem cells or if you got sterile saline in the joint. There's not a ton of people who are jumping to sign up for those right now. So we don't have that. And the other thing is the FDA takes a long time to approve new procedures, such as anterior hip approach, which is now the standard procedure to do a hip replacement. It took 15 years to get it through the FDA um, for approval. So things can, can take a while, you know, as far as uh, getting, getting them covered. Um, can you get the procedure more than once? Yes, you can. So I do have some colleagues at, at Harvard who've been doing this for many years and say that they'll have a patient who had the procedure done 10, 12 years ago and was scheduled for total joint replacement and has come back and said, hey, doc, they've been awesome. They're starting to bug me a little bit now. Can we repeat it? Yeah, so it can be done again. Sometimes we just need to do some more platelets. You know, sometimes patients will come see me after a few years and say, hey, they've been great, but I, I think I overdid it. I swam too much or I lifted too heavy and now it's been bugging me. You know, should we repeat the stem cell procedure? I said, we don't need to repeat it. Let's just put some platelets in there. It's quick, it takes about 15, 20 minutes. And uh, oftentimes it's kind of like, the analogy I use is that you have this bare spot in your lawn and whatever, three months, six months, a year or two ago, you put seed and you put fertilizer on it. And, you know, you look out there now at that bare spot, and there's grass growing there, but it doesn't look quite as good as the rest of the grass. So what do you do? You put some more fertilizer on it. That's what platelets are. 
and PRP is significantly less expensive than repeating a whole stem cell procedure. And most people tend to do just fine with a, a PRP booster. All right, let's see what else. Um, oh, what is a PRP injection? So we just kind of went over that, it's platelets. Um, it's basically, we just draw blood from you and then uh, isolate those platelets, pipette them off and then inject them into the joint. Um, what is the cost that is not covered by insurance? Okay, so typically physical therapy, follow-ups, consultations are all covered by insurance. The procedure itself tends to run for a large joint somewhere between five and $10,000, depending upon if it's one joint or two joints or, or which joints specifically or which areas we're, we're looking at treating. That's for full on gold standard stem cells from bone marrow, from fat and platelets from blood. Now, people oftentimes ask, can they use like if they have a, a health savings account or a flexible spending account? Yeah, it's a medical expense and certainly people do use those all the time. Uh, let's see. Does the procedure vary? Does the procedure vary any depending on the age of the patient? Uh, no, basically it does not. It's just that, you know, if we have somebody who's 30 years old and they're 6'4 and big muscular individual, we're going to get some more stem cells than, you know, a 90-year-old patient. However, the stem cells that we get from a 90-year-old patient are still just fine. We're just not going to get as many of them per se. But, I mean, we've, we've done hundreds of patients in their 90s who are doing just great and we're able to avoid total shoulder replacements or, you know, oftentimes patients in their 90s don't want to go through six to eight months of, of therapy and put themselves through the risk of anesthesia and, and surgery. Um, so let's see. So the average out-of-pocket cost is that same cost. It's somewhere between five and $10,000. Um, the rest, you know, as far as follow-up and, and uh, physical therapy is, is covered. There's a lot of questions here on cost. Hopefully um, I've answered all of those. Um, during the first three weeks, is PT just to focus on active uh, range of motion? When can we introduce resistive activity? Yeah, basically in the first few weeks, we're working on range of motion. And we're starting with early strengthening exercises. What I like to avoid are what I call shear forces. That would be like doing a push-up. That would be like doing heavy weight where you're kind of shearing the joint because those stem cells when they become chondrocytes, they form these little things called um, CFUs. CFUs are colony forming units and they cluster all along the area that we're treating. And then they start to lay down new cartilage or in the case of a rotator cuff tear, you know, they start to heal the, the tendon and, and the muscle. So we just don't wanna to do too much too fast because we don't wanna damage those cells in, in those first few weeks. By the time we get six weeks, things are a little more stable. People are able to tolerate more, um, but sometimes, uh, you know, we really have to pull, pull the reins in and kind of limit patients from, from doing too much. Uh, let's see. Um, I have uh, bicipital tendonitis, small tear, now likely a larger one, and other issues. How many treatments would I need? That's the beauty of it. This is one treatment. It's an hour and a half at most. Um, and then you walk out. So everything is done within our procedure room at our office in the space of an hour and a half. The harvesting the, the platelets from blood, harvesting the stem cells from bone marrow, and harvesting the stem cells from fat, concentrating, super concentrating, preparing those cells, and then injecting them back into the joint. The cells never leave the room where the patient is. Everything is done sterilely. It's a very meticulous process because everything that those cells touch not only has to be sterile, but also has to be anticoagulated because bone marrow tends to clot very quickly. So every piece of tubing, every inside and outside of every needle, everything in the machines has to be coated with heparin so that those samples don't clot. Um, but everything is done, you know, by virtue of the guy who used to run the molecular biology department at Stanford. He kind of 
came up with this software program that we're able to kind of do everything in an hour and a half, which is just really, really nice. Plus, we're getting higher levels of cells than anything I've seen that has come out around the world. I used to use a system out of Japan about five years ago, but this far exceeds the numbers of cells that we're getting or that we get from anything else. Um, let's see. So no severe pain right now, definitely daily pain. Should you wait until full bone injury? No. So the earlier you jump on these issues, the better people do. So if you can catch somebody who's got mild osteoarthritis or a less, what we call a less than 50% tear in their, their rotator cuff tear or small labrum tear, people do better if you jump on them early. If we wait till somebody's got severe arthritis or just a macerated labrum or a rotator cuff that's a chronic tear that's pulled away from the bone and is atrophied, which when that happens, you, surgery doesn't make it. No surgeon will touch it either because you're not going to be able to get it back together. And if you try, you're going to end up with a really stiff, painful shoulder. Um, so yeah, the big thing is kind of jump on these things. You know, basically, if you can catch the horse before he's out of the barn, people do do really, really well. Um, uh, is osteoarthritis in the shoulder actually a cartilage issue? What do stem cells do with bone-on-bone -bone arthritis? Well, I'll tell you, you know, the, the term bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, I, uh, patient, either patients hear it from their surgeon or somebody else, say, oh yeah, geez, you're bone-on-bone. 95% -bone. of the time, that I actually look at the images that patient, patients bring to me, they're not bone on bone. Um, there may be little areas in the cartilage where there's a fissure or a crack or a crater that goes through to the bone. But most of the time when people hear this term bone on bone, they assume that there's nothing there in the joint anymore. That tends not to be the case in, like I said, about 90 to 95% of, of all patients. Um, I have been diagnosed currently with what my, oh, it says I haven't been diagnosed currently with what my injury is, tear or otherwise. Will that be part of the initial visit? Yes. I mean, we want to know what's going on. I'm not going to treat anybody just because they have shoulder pain. Um, so sometimes on an x-ray, we can see osteoarthritis. And if it's moderate, I mean, or even mild, you know, we see bone spurs, we see changes within the joint that are very indicative of osteoarthritis. However, rotator cuff tears and labrum tears, we need to do an MRI in order to be able to see those. And the way I like to do the MRIs is I like to do them with contrast, in other words, with dye, because that gives us significantly more informa information. I have so many patients that come to me with an MRI that was done wherever by, by somebody else, and it wasn't done with dye. And it's, uh, I, I, I never do MRIs of the shoulders without dye because it just gives us so much more information. So that's, you know, that's something, we don't do the MRI in our office, but we have many offices close by and all over that we use to do MRIs. And then I read the films and then that, that gives me the information that I need so that I can intelligently talk to the patient about whether or not they're, they're a candidate for stem cell therapy. Um, I know this is more focused on shoulder. Feel, <laughs> feel free to skip this one. Uh, for weight bearing joints, knees, uh, is there a too far gone point where stem cell therapy won't help? We used to think that. And I, you know, when I first started out doing this for knees, um, if patients had severe arthritis, I mean, I've seen some patients that bone on bone, yes, and not much joint space. And they're referred to me by their surgeon or their internist or primary care doc because they're just not a candidate for uh, total joint replacement. Maybe they've got significant heart disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes, obesity, and they come to me in tears and they get referred by their surgeon who says, well, go talk to Wagner about stem cells. So about four years ago, we started treating these patients um, who have severe osteoarthritis. And boy, I tell you, they do really well. 
I mean, they're not going to be running a marathon, but, you know, they can play with their grandkids and they can go out and go for a walk and, and it makes a significant difference. So, yes, I mean, I, I have patients who I look at the joints and they just look terrible and boy, they're, they're just so pleased after three, six months, whatever. All right, let's move on. I'm told it's bone on bone. Does that mean it's too late? So we talked about that just minutes ago. No, because oftentimes it's not bone on bone. Uh, I'm terrified of bone marrow aspiration. I don't think you realize how terrified. I have basically no pain threshold. Trying to get past the that BC, it sounds like adipose tissue isn't an option. Okay, so I, we have a lot of patients who've had bone marrow aspirations done. Either they donated bone marrow to somebody or maybe they had uh, leukemia or lymphoma at some point in their lifetime and they are terrified of the bone marrow aspiration. After they've had the procedure done at our office, they're shocked at how, at the difference. Um, we, like I said, we've, I've done over 16,000 bone marrow aspirations and they just go so smoothly. We give patients pain medication ahead of time. We use local anesthetic. And it just, it goes really smoothly. Granted, there might be a minute or so of pain. If patients are really, really, really adverse to doing it, fat and platelets is an option, although I prefer doing bone marrow, fat, and platelets. But really, I mean, a lot of people are scared about the, the bone marrow. Um, it's, it's really not that big of a deal. And the, like I said, the pain is so short-lived. Um, should I expect to repeat the procedure in a year or later? No. Um, what do stem cells do in the shoulder relative to osteoarthritis? Basically, they stop the breakdown of the cartilage and they regenerate new cartilage. So no, our, our plan is one and done when we do the procedure. I have only repeat, in the seven years I've been doing this, I've only repeated stem cell procedure in three patients. One is a patient who had their knees done, was doing great, and then got in a motor vehicle accident. It was a head-on collision where her knees impacted the dashboard, and she significantly damaged the cartilage behind the knees. And so she came to me and she said, well, I, I just want to definitely do it again. Um, and we did, and she's doing great. The other one is a guy, and it was also knees. He uh, had severe arthritis in both knees, but he's an ultra marathoner, and his bucket list goal was to run the Western States 100 in under 24 hours. We did his knees. Uh, he trained for two years. He did wonderfully. He, he made his goal. He, he did the race. His knees killed him afterwards. He came back. He said, Doc, he said, would you please do it again? I promise you I'm done running. I'll cycle, which is the best thing you can do for your knees. And we did him again. And he's still doing great. The other is, um, is a woman who's a professional tennis player who came back after a year. And she said, yeah, hey, doc, she goes, I want to I want to do my knees, guys. Oh, no. I said, are they bothering you? She said, no, no, I just want insurance. And she was more money than God. And I said, well, I can't guarantee that that's going to make a difference, but she wanted to do it. We did it. She's doing wonderfully. Um, so that's the only times that, that I've really repeated it. But when people get out 10, 12 years, you know, like I said, some of my colleagues around the country do find that sometimes they, they do repeat them, and it certainly can be repeated. Um, I have, I have an orthopedic right knee with a lot of scar tissue with adhesions and limited range of motion, less than 90 degrees bend and about five to 10 degrees of flexion would have been, I guess I don't know what this, if, if this means that it's a, that you had a knee replacement on your right knee, in which case, no, if you already have metal and plastic in there, stem cells are not going to make any difference. If it's just that you've got significant issues in that knee with, and it had surgery on the knee uh, with adhesions and range of motion, then yes, there's a very good chance that you would do well. Obviously, I'm, I, it's something I need to look at, look at the range of motion, look at the strength, look at the joint, look at the, the films. And that's, that's part of what we do at consultation because I, I, I don't want to do procedures on anybody who I don't think has a very good chance at, at getting better. Oh, just surgery. Okay, yes. So for surgery, yes, I, I think there, there's a good chance. Certainly I would uh, set up a consultation and you know we can kind of delve into that a little bit more. 
Can you take VA, I'm assuming uh, this for a veteran, um, should be covered as far as, once again, the same thing goes, consultation, follow-ups, physical therapy, but the procedure still is, is not covered by the VA. We've done a number of veterans. Um, sorry, but I missed most of the meeting. I have a 90% labrum tear in the left shoulder. Would stem cells be recommended? Absolutely. You're probably a good candidate. Once again, I think certainly worth consultation so that I could see the images, the films, examine the shoulder and, and, and talk about, you know, what I think the options and what the percentages are at improving. Um, but certainly, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's something we deal with all the time. Um, if stem cell therapy costs between five and 10,000, how much does PRP therapy cost? Uh, PRP, for a large joint tends to run around 1100. Uh, payment plans over time, unfortunately we don't. We try to do something, uh, one of these payment plans for medical procedures, but I think we had two patients who opted for it. It just was so prohibitively expensive with um, the, the percent interest rate and they tack something on to the overall cost. So most of our patients just said, you know, they'd rather just interest rates are so good, they go get an interest-free credit card at their, their bank and kind of make their own payment plan. Um, was the Zoom meet, meeting recorded? Sorry, I missed it due to work. Yes, it is recorded, and I think you can just act, be able to access it um, just on YouTube. So if you pull up my name and... Everyone who registered. Oh, I guess also everyone who registered for this will get the link to the YouTube video. All right, I have an orthopedic right knee with a lot of, oh, this is the, we, we, we took, looked at that already. Um, do, uh, yes, I have so many physical therapists that I work with on a regular basis all over the country because we see patients come from actually all over the world. And they are, um, a lot of these therapists have come and watched procedures. I've spoken with large groups of physical therapists. We also send out, um, the protocols of what we like done after the procedure. And I end up talking to a lot of the physical therapists before they see the patients or after or while they're treating the patients, because I want to make sure that everything is, is done according to the way I, I like to see it get done. Um, where can I sign up for a study? Unfortunately, right now, the last study that was going on was a study down at uh, Stanford where they were just looking at fat to see if fat was as good as bone marrow fat and, and platelets. And they stopped it halfway through because they found that the results were not as good. Um, I don't know of any studies, at least for orthopedic conditions that are going on right now. There are some studies going on for treatment of um, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, and I believe MS. Um, I, I don't know exactly where though. Um, Next question, I use platform crutches and a tall walker. Can you use these after stem cell therapy? Yes, definitely you, you can use those afterwards. Um, and, and we might even try to modify things a little bit so we take some of the stress off, off of the joint, but no, that shouldn't be an issue. I have broken off bone spurs with my arthritis. What do I do about those? If the bone spurs are actually in the joint and causing issues in the joint, like locking or catching in the joint, then, then they need to be removed. And that's arthroscopic surgery. But most of the time, bone spurs are on the periphery of the joint, not within the joint. And they're there as a result of the problem. In other words, you have arthritis, you have a rotator cuff tear, you have a labrum tear, your shoulder isn't moving or functioning biomechanically the way that it should. And that's why those bone spurs develop. But like I said, most of the time, you won't see a bone spur that breaks off and, and is in the joint itself. So bone spurs in them, we're not gonna knock them off or do anything uh, to take them away because they're the one, they're not causing the problem, they're there as a result of the problem. Um, Bursitis, rotator cuff tears, and frozen shoulder. Cortisone didn't work. I wouldn't expect that it would. Um, would this be a good next step? Oh, absolutely. Um, certainly, um, 
the reason you get frozen shoulder is usually because there's something going on inside the joint, some inflammatory process. And then what happens is you don't use it and you use it less and less and less till eventually you can't even eat. You can't get your, your hand to your mouth or you can't comb your hair. And um, we've treated many, many patients with frozen shoulder um, that, that do very, very well. And it is in combination with physical therapy, definitely. Um, I'm 81 years old with these therapy. Oh, absolutely. We treat patients well into their 90s. Um, will it fix poor eyesight? Um, I don't do eyes, but there are people who are doing stem cell treatments for retinal problems. And that's, um, I don't know of anybody in Seattle or in the Northwest is doing that. Um, I think there is an eye clinic in, in Florida that is doing it. Um, but yeah, I couldn't, couldn't give you any more information uh, on that. My son is 18, pursuing college baseball career. He has what, is be, what has been called a scuffed labrum and is currently undergoing PRP. If that does not heal his shoulder, do you believe that stem cell therapy is a more aggressive option? Yeah, and I, I agree. I probably, in an 18-year-old, all depending upon what the MRI looked like, um, I, I would probably do PRP first. And, and then if they do well with PRP, great. If not, then, then we talk about stem cells. I have had rotator cuff surgery twice, 30 years apart, was wondering if given shoulder pain now, would stem cell or PRP help? Very likely, it all depends what the issue is. If you've had rotator cuff surgery, you probably have some pathology in the cuff. Um, and it most likely would be a very good option. Once again, it would be something we'd want to get an MRI, we'd want to be able to see, unless you have osteoarthritis in the joint, in which case then, yeah, definitely, depending upon the level of arthritis, it would probably be a very good option. Um, if I need to repair more than one joint, can that be done with one harvest and one appointment? Yes. So the most that we can do at one time, because there's you basically have two sides to your pelvis, that's where we get the bone marrow from. So we can do two large joints at basically one visit. Um, I also have done two large joints and a, sm one, a small joint or two at the same time. That's when I talk about small joints, we're usually talking about thumbs or big toes. Um, but yeah, the nice thing about doing more than one joint, and we have a lot of people who come in, they've got problems with both shoulders or a shoulder and a knee, a shoulder and a hip. The nice thing about doing two large joints at one time, we're able to combine the, the surgical kits and it saves patients a lot of money. It ends up saving them about $4,000 to do two joints at once. Um, what are the steps I need to take to begin the process of having you treat me? Basically, it would just be calling uh, into our office and making an appointment for a consultation getting together, if you've had filmed any imaging within the past year or two years, whether it be MRI or x-rays, if you get me those discs and the reports, it just streamlines the process significantly. Um, I don't know where you're calling from, but um, you know, if patients are from far away, we do Zoom calls. And, and as long as I have the images in front of me, we can usually do consultation. We see a lot of patients from overseas, a lot of patients from Asia, a lot of people from Europe and Australia, and they'll send their images and the reports, and I'll have time to look at everything. And then we set up a, basically a Zoom consultation where we kind of go over everything. And then we had a lady actually who flew in last night from uh, Ketchikan. And this was my first time meeting her because we've done everything on Zoom and she's scheduled tomorrow morning to have, I think it's both, I think it's both her shoulders done. Um, Already have an MRI, does that help the cost? Well, it helps them just the fact that we don't need to order another MRI, but typically MRIs are covered by insurance, but it doesn't make any difference as far as the, the cost of the procedure. MRIs most typically are covered by insurance. Sometimes we have to jump through some hoops and be a little creative, but yes. I have heard that cartilage cannot be replaced. Can stem cells do this? Yes, they do. And they basically do heal lesions in cartilage and increase the thickness of the cartilage. What about surgery on the show? What, what about after surgery on a rotator cuff? We have a lot of patients that come in with failed procedures. They had a rotator cuff surgery a year or two, five years ago, and now they've got continued pain or new onset of pain or, you know, a, 
progressive tear on their rotator cuff. And yes, we definitely treat patients that have had surgery that are not doing well. And, and patients tend to do very well. Um, realistically, what type of activity level can I return to? Fitness competitions, weights, et cetera. Um, it all depends. It depends what the issue is. I, uh, we treated a power lifter just um, a few months ago. It was back to power lifting for shoulder, the rotator cuff. We've had a number of biceps uh, tears that we've treated who are back to full on activity. Um, I actually got a very good friend of mine who is a, a triathlete, Ironman triathlete, that we treated his shoulder, and he's back swimming full time and lifting weights and mountain biking. So it all depends. It depends on what what exactly is going on in that shoulder joint, and that's certainly something that we we cover. We go over extensively when we do the consultation. Um, how many professional baseball pitchers have had this procedure? Many. <laughs> so I've seen a number in the office, um, both collegiate, high school, and professional athletes um, who have done well. It all, once again, it all depends on exactly what's going on there. Um, professional athletes do use stem cells quite a bit because they, they want to get back on the court or back on the field um, and get back quickly and safely. Um, let's see. Is age an issue in treating a patient with any of stem cell procedures? ACL replacement was not recommended in persons over 60. I also have meniscus tears. No, stem cells work really, really well for meniscus tears. Um, they work really well for partial ACL tears. They do not treat complete ACL tears. Um, you know, as far as re reconstructing an ACL in a 60-year-old, it all depends on the 60-year-old. Um, you know, if somebody's got an unstable knee, and they're healthy and they're active and they've got, you know, looking at another 20, 30 years of, of not being able what they want to do. I don't know that, I don't know that uh, age is, is a de-qualifying factor for ACL surgery, but that would be up to the, to the knee surgeon. Um, let's see. I have a very complicated shoulder that has been through several surgeries in an attempt to repair a hole in my I imagine supraspinatus. Both times I ended up with an infection and the repair was removed. Hence, I have a torn tendon that has not been able to be repaired. And what I've been told is eventually I will need a shoulder replacement. Can you help me? I think that there's a good possibility of it. I, I don't know until I actually see um, the images and see, you know, kind of examine the shoulder and probably see what was done surgically. But I mean, I have certainly treated patients with similar histories who have done done very well. I think it's pretty much your best option, uh, given the fact that you're up against the wall with a, a total shoulder replacement. But once again, you got, got to look at the images and films because, um, you know, I I don't want to treat anybody uh, who I don't think is going to significantly benefit from from the procedure. Um, do you take medical insurance? Yeah, we're on all the insurances. Um, at our office uh, with the exception of, well, no, I say that. I'd say Kaiser, Kaiser has, we are on some plans with Kaiser, but I'm not a contracted physician who works for Kaiser. So that that's the difference. Um, I had an acute tear of my right supraspinatus for about three years. So if it's a complete tear at three years, there's not much you can do for it surgically, but, and, and stem cells, if it's a complete tear that's totally pulled apart is not gonna bring it back together. However, we treat a lot of patients who do really well as far as pain and function with stem cells, but we're not gonna necessarily bring the tendon back. Um, it all depends. I, I don't know what the status of that tendon would be. Um, and, and once again, that would do, you know, rely on imaging. Um, I have a partial, to partially torn supraspinatus and the right shoulder confirmed by MRI surgery ruled out for now. And I have taken four months of PT through IRG frozen shoulder is set in. I'm a type one diabetic. Are there complications with this procedure or does this disqualify me? No, absolutely not. I treat many, many, many diabetics who don't want to have surgery because of issues with diabetes. And um, I, I would think at this point, if you have a partially torn supraspinatus, um, certainly doing stem cells, is a really good option. The only time, the only things that we see as a contraindication to surgery is if somebody has cancer 
and is being treated for cancer, or if they're on blood thinners, i.e. Coumadin, Warfarin, Eliquis, uh, Zeralto, those type things. And we can usually get around that. We talk to the prescribing physician, whether it be the patient's cardiologist or internist, and um, say, is it okay? Can the patient go off of this blood thinner for a couple of days? As long as they can, we go off of it, depending upon the medication for two to five days, and they start back the, after the procedure. Um, can you clarify how it helps adhesive capsulitis? Basically by reducing inflammation. Um, Inflammation is what causes the problem with adhesive capsulitis along with immobility. And when you get inflammation in the, uh, basically the capsule of the shoulder joint, you get scar tissue and it just tightens down and tightens down. So um, by, by virtue of decreasing the inflammatory process and then working with physical therapy, we can get that range of motion back and elim eliminate the need to do like a manipulation under anesthesia. Um, how does, why does PRP stem cell therapy help just tendonitis as there's no cartilage? Because, just because of the anti-inflammatory effects. And what PRP does is, and, and stem cells too, they stimulate this healing process, which is your body's own process. Inflammatory or inflammation is how we heal. And so basically PRP is your body's way of kind of kickstarting that healing process and decreasing the inflammation. Once diagnosed as a good candidate for stem cell therapy, is there a timeline that you would suggest having it done? Um, yeah, I talked about that earlier. You wanna do it sooner rather than later because the percentages, the numbers are, are significantly better the earlier you, you jump on these conditions. Frozen shoulder girl had MRI, but not with contrast. Ortho advised, only advice and direction is more cortisone shots. Should I insist on MRI with contrast or get a consult with somebody like me? Totally up to you. I would say if that's all they're doing is just giving you cortisone shots, I think there's better options than, than doing that. And um, I would probably, I would look at the MR first and then if it's not giving me the information I need, I'd probably reorder an MRI with a contrast at, at one of the facilities that we use that I know does a really good job. Um, I think we are through all of the questions. So once again, I'd like to thank everybody and uh, tell you this will be available on YouTube. You'll get the link um, on your email. And uh, there's also another video on, on YouTube that talks more about knees, hips, shoulders, ankles, wrists, and, and elbows. So thank you all and, and have a uh, wonderful evening.